I'm going to start off today's events by saying a bit about the background context um, for the report in terms of the recent history of electronic monitoring. Uh, I'll also say a bit about the methodology for our inspection and give you a few key headlines. And then I'll hand over to Shelley Adams, who was the lead inspector for this review, who will be taking you through the findings in some more detail under the key headings you can see on this slide, which correspond to the main sections in the report. Uh, you'll then be hearing from Tammy Burrows about the Effective Practice Guide, which we published alongside this report, and then from Dr Sarah Lewis from the organisation uh, Penal Reform Solutions, who interviewed 42 people on probation on our behalf about their experience of being electronically monitored, and you can find their report on our website uh, as well. Next slide, please. So first, just a bit of background um, context. Electronic monitoring has been uh, in use on a significant scale in England and Wales for over 20 years now, um, starting with the introduction of home detention curfew in 1999, which, uh, as many of you will know, enables the early release of prisoners serving less than four year sentences for up to 135 days at the end of the prison part of their sentence, uh, provided that they agree to being curfewed uh, at their own address, and typically that curfew is overnight. Uh, elect however, electronic monitoring can also uh, be ordered as part of a community sentence um, for up to 12 months, uh, and that for up to 16 hours in every 24, although more usually people are curfewed uh, for 12 hours per night. Uh, more recently, since 2018 to 19, we've had the option of GPS monitoring to track someone's movements both day and night um, and GPS tagging can now be used both as a court order and as a post-release license condition uh, and incidentally it's also being used separately by the police with their own tagging arrangements for example with uh, integrated offender management cases, IOM cases. And then most recently of all since 2020 we've seen the introduction of a new type of tag which can monitor someone's alcohol use uh, and that can be used to enforce alcohol abstinence requirements either again as part of a court order when the abstinence requirements can be for up to 120 days or and this is now being piloted in Wales you can use alcohol tabs with people who are being released from prison as a license condition. Just a quick overview of the sorts of numbers of people who are being electronically monitored we think uh, there are approximately 8,000 people on probation being uh, monitored at any one time. Although, as these figures show, in any given year, the numbers actually starting and ending a uh, period of electronic tagging will be significantly more than this. Um, you'll see from the figures on this uh, sheet that um, alcohol monitoring has proved, proved relatively popular, even though it's not been rolled out for very long. Over 1,500 people have had alcohol abstinence conditions attached. Uh, GPS requirements, interestingly, particularly as a court order, have been perhaps less commonly used. Uh, less than 500 of those <coughs> imposed in the year before our field work, and we say a bit in the, in the report about why that may be so. Next slide. Next slide, please, Kevin, on methodology. So a bit about how we did the, the fieldwork for this uh, study. The fieldwork was conducted in the summer of last year, July and September. Um, we were looking at, we were inspecting cases which had actually started their period of monitoring between November of 2020 and January of 2021 to give us the chance to look at a, a decent period of monitoring. And we focused our fieldwork on the six areas that you can see on this map uh, around England, but also looking at uh, cases in Wales. Uh, we aim to try and capture examples of all the different types of monitoring that I've described. So our sample of 172 cases did include some fixed curfew tags. We also looked at uh, GPS cases and we looked at 10 cases involving alcohol monitoring uh, in Wales. About half of the sample we looked at were community order cases. The other half were people who'd been released um, from prison. Uh, and as you'll see from the slide, we interviewed a very large number and wide range of people, including 
practitioners who'd been supervising the cases uh, in our fieldwork sample. We also talked to judges. We talked to staff involved in the electronic monitoring programme at HMPPS head office. Uh, and as you'll hear in a bit, we also talked to a sample of people uh, who were on tags themselves or who had been recently monitored because it was important to get their views um, as well. Next slide. Shelley is going to talk about our detailed findings in a moment. And I don't want to steal her thunder, but for me, I think some of the key messages that came out of this inspection were, I think firstly, we feel that uh, electronic monitoring is potentially a very valuable tool for probation. It can break criminal habits and associations. It can provide greater structure for people's lives. And there's good research evidence that at least for the period that people are being monitored, it does reduce their reoffending. Um, some of the people that we spoke to who had been monitored were positive about the impact it had had on their life and helping them to get back on the straight and narrow. Second key message, however, is that to be used to best effect, electronic monitoring does need to be properly and embedded and integrated into day to day probation practice. And I think we found missed opportunities at each stage of probation delivery for electronic monitoring, particularly I think probably GPS location monitoring to be recommended in court and used with a wider set of released prisoners. And we found that the valuable information you get from monitoring, for example, about people's movements, wasn't being incorporated into routine supervision or review meetings. And we found that practitioners could sometimes be confused about when monitoring could be used. Uh, and we found a clear need for a national strategy linked to a clear operational frame that. Having said that monitoring is being underused, however, we were also concerned to find that it's being used sometimes with the wrong people. Uh, and we found a lack, for example, of domestic abuse and safeguarding checks before curfew conditions were recommended in court or home detention curfew releases were being uh, approved. And potentially that is putting people at risk from people with a past history of violence. So our reports include some key recommendations about a much more mandatory approach to making sure that those sort of domestic abuse and safeguarding checks do happen, both pre-sentence in court and after release from prison, to make sure that electronic monitoring is being used safely. So some very headline uh, findings there, but let's hand over now to, to Shelley for some more detail behind all of that. Shelley. Apologies. Thanks, Justin, and thanks to everybody who's joined us today. Um, so, Kevin, can we have the next slide, please? Um, as, as Justin said, I'll take you through the key findings and our key recommendations. Um, the initial, initial part of this is around leadership policy and strategy. As you may be aware, um, during whilst we were actually conducting the inspection, an additional £183 million was announced by government as an investment in electronic monitoring going forward. And that's against the backdrop of that innovation and increased use of electronic monitoring that Justin spoke about over the last four years. We're therefore very interested to understand how that leadership policy and strategy were impacting on service delivery. The first key finding in relation to, to that was that Unfortunately, there was a lack of strategic direction at a national level. So there was a previous strategy paper published, well, but written as a draft covering 2019 to 2024, but that wasn't agreed or implemented. Um, and an initial outline of future for electronic monitoring services strategy had been drafted um, in June 2021, shortly before we began this inspection, although it had not been widely shared um, or agreed at the point of the inspection. Following on from this, it was also disappointing, although perhaps not surprising to find there was a, a lack of clear vision at a national level of how electronic monitoring can enhance probation supervision um, and a lack of clearly defined purpose. In part, um, I felt that this was due to contract packages um, in terms of electronic monitoring, monitoring, they're managed as a whole contract package, which also spans police and home office use. And this often came at a cost of having specific measures in place to promote best use within probation. 
One of the things we particularly struggled with throughout the inspection was a lack of reliable data. This was in relation to both collection and analysis of data, um, including the demographic of individuals being made subject to electronic monitoring and also the types being used and the overall impact and outcome. It's also of note that probation recording systems are not designed to adequately capture electronic monitoring information. This significantly limits out our understanding of what electronic monitoring is having, what impact it's having, or even what the landscape across probation in terms of how it's being used looks. Next slide, please, Kevin. So, um, as Justin had said, um, we looked across case management in terms of um, a number of different areas, um, starting with pre-sentence and pre-release. Our key findings from that um, largely centre around those domestic abuse and child safeguarding check, checks. <coughs> excuse me. Um, and, and, uh, and albeit we felt that some of those were those findings are quite worrying. So first and foremost were concerns around the completion of domestic abuse child safeguarding checks, either at pre-sentence or pre-release on home detention curfew. And this was specifically around recommendations for people to be made subject to, um, to curfew at a home address. What we found were that domestic abuse checks were only undertaken on 37% of cases pre-sentence at court, um, where, where a curfew was being proposed um, and although better, still insufficiently completed in 68% of HDC releases, those home detention uh, curfew releases. Checks in regard to safeguarding children were higher um, in terms of 61% in applicable court cases and 79% in applicable home detention curfew cases, although of course we would like to have seen these higher. So that in itself is a concern and uh, we've made a number of recommendations as a consequence. One of the biggest concerns around that uh, was in respect of leadership and policy, as, as alarming as it is that those, those checks checks are not always being completed. Um, it's also concerning there's no central policy directing the mandatory completion of either domestic abuse or child safeguarding checks. We found that a particular concern in respect to curfews for obvious reasons in terms of an individual who may either be a perpetrator or a potential victim of domestic abuse is sentenced to reside and remain at a specific address. Um, also within those key findings about pre-sentence pre-release um, were the assessments to inform release on home detention curfews. Policy changes over the last four years or so have changed the pre-release assessment provided by probation practitioners and it's now centred around an address check suitability without wider consideration of risk issues. In terms of our inspection, um, we considered that only 28% of cases had an assessment pre-release regarding home detention curfew that was suitably analytical and personalised. So the actual ability to offer a comprehensive assessment of even the address is limited from a probation practitioner perspective. And as a consequence, we concluded that assessment processes for potential release on HDC are not robust enough to ensure that all risk information is taken into consideration um, when making those release decisions. Next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. So in terms of probation service delivery, the key findings around that, um, as as Justin had spoke about there, we found that many probation practitioners have insufficient knowledge and understanding of how electronic monitoring should be used to support the management of their cases and consequently are not using the technology to the best advantage and that included court staff on making sentencing proposals. Of those 102 probation practitioners that we spoke to on a one-to-one -one interview, only 28% of them said they'd received any electronic monitoring training. In addition to, think, to this, and I think it's a really important point and I have spoken to it in the report, there are an exceptional number of policy and guidance documents available for probation practi practitioners. However, these are largely process driven and are not particularly easily accessible either. So EQUIP is, is the forum on which um, probation documents are held um, to inform probation practitioners of, of guidance, policies, training, etc. 
um, having looked at equip and with specific reference to electronic monitoring, I found that there was in excess of 120 documents that sat across 47 different locations, all with different types of guidance and information on it in relation to electronic monitoring. And that's just not manageable or accessible for really busy probation practitioners. In specific um, relation to GPS, um, which is the newer of the of the technologies available, the global positioning systems, um, which came online from 2018-19, we found examples of a lack of training, including court officers who were not aware that GPS monitoring was even available as an option um, for those facing a sentence within the courts on a community order. Officers who have been allocated cases with GPS requirements in some cases were then failing to request data or activity or actively discussing um, data um, with their person on probation as part of the supervision process. So part of the GPS requirements that's available as an option would be trail monitoring whereby you could have those proactive conversations with somebody about their activities and we saw in some cases that just was not happening um, and officers stated they, they felt they'd had a lack of training around how to do that in a case management way. There were also scenarios whereby individuals had separate trail monitoring requirements and an exclusion zone. However, the exclusion zone was not explicitly monitored via GPS. However, practitioners incorrectly thought they would receive notifications of violations of exclusion zones where this just wasn't the case. Um, so, so we found significant gaps there in that training around GPS. Encouragingly, 92% of the probation practitioners we thought to, we spoke to, thought electronic monitoring would be helpful in managing risk. However, this only translated to being included within risk management plans in 60% of the applicable cases. Um, also encouragingly, 88% of probation practitioners thought electronic monitoring would be helpful in supporting desistance. Um, but in contrast, this was only evidenced in 11% of written sentence plans. There was also a lack of discussion at the start of any electronic monitoring requirement, and that continued throughout the sentence at the point of the requirement ending. So there was a lack of overall integration in the sentence as a whole. Um, and I think, Sarah, when we come to you, you'll also discuss that communication element uh, from the people on probation that, that you spoke to. So whilst licences were enforced fairly consistently, um, with enforcement actions being taken when required in 87% of cases, this fell to only 50% of community orders, with the lowest level of enforcement being evidenced in community orders with curfew requirements, which was at 56%. Those licence conditions with GPS requirements were most likely to be enforced at 94%. Um, what I'd add there is that those licence cases with GPS requirements are most likely to be the high risk cases. Um, so 94% uh, is, is an encouraging figure to see, although th there remain some gaps. Next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. Um, just to round off the probation service delivery key findings, um, again, as I would said around the GPS systems as a sentencing option not being fully understood um, and in part I think that relates to um, practitioners perhaps joining the court service at a time after the, the initial rollout um, and there's been, been a lack of consistent reinforcement and training around GPS as a, as a sentencing option. Um, in terms of access to data, um, this, this represented examples, there were examples where it's not being used to its full potential. So there were some officers who were regularly requesting data for cases where there were GPS requirements, but were met with inadequate response times with movement data, that trail monitoring data, taking up to three days to be returned, um, making it less meaningful in proactive supervision discussions. Um, this forms a basis of a number of recommendations going forward um, in terms of both training, integration and, and response times for being able to access information. 
So the final key finding around probation service delivery is around the scope of electronic monitoring. So the scope for inclusion of electronic monitoring in the management of high risk cases is too narrow, but this only being an option when imposed by the parole board for specific sentence types. Um, that's around life sentences, imprisonment for public protection and extended determinate sentences unless subject to particular pilots, of which there are now a number um, and I will discuss them briefly at the end. Um, and I believe there's more to come on board as well. However, um, in terms of the current use of um, electronic monitoring, specifically around GPS, uh, this follows policy making decisions after a, an initial um, prison and probation HMPPS trial of electronic monitoring. However, it didn't follow the findings of the, what, the poly, what the pilot found in terms of where practitioners were wanting to actually apply electronic monitoring. So in terms of that earlier pilot pre-policy making, um, there was options for courts to use GPS at a disposal and also uh, probation practitioners or parole board members to request GPS monitoring. Um, in that 18 month period of the pilot, only 14, um, 14, sorry, 24 community orders were made in comparison to either um, either requesting an additional license uh, condition following recall or license variation to to try to avoid recall being requested in over 170 cases however policy making didn't follow that um, uh, and was applied to um, community orders or particular um, parole board releases there were examples on a national basis of voluntary gps tags being used they're provided by police colleagues and are commissioned through the buddy system, um, buddy contract. And these are being used to monitor high risk cases through multi-agency public protection arrangements and integrated offender management arrangements, however, are applied on a voluntary basis. So if a person on probation, well, first of all, they have to agree to being subject to that that monitoring and if they choose to request it, it has to be removed um, if they say they're no longer willing to engage on that voluntary basis. The areas that we visited um, all had access to buddy tags, some more than others, um, but what we were told repeatedly was that they are literally waiting to take it off one person's ankle to put it onto another person's in terms of those high risk cases. Um, many practitioners fed back that they were unable to use the centrally provided electronic monitoring technologies on cases where they felt it was most needed and would add most value in terms of public protection. And that was namely around standard determinate uh, sentenced cases who'd committed violent or sexual offences um, who posed a high risk of harm. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So moving on to our recommendations, there are total uh, 17 in total uh, that span the Ministry of Justice, HMPPS and the Probation Service. Um, I haven't listed them all here. Um, I have listed the three key recommendations for Ministry of Justice. There are only three for the Ministry of Justice. Uh, first, first and foremost, improve that data collection and analysis um, and tied into that is commission structured research so that um, we're able to actually see what the landscape of electronic monitoring looks like, how it's being used, what the impact, what the outcomes are, um, and how best to invest um, future monies in terms of, uh, in terms of expansion. Um, in terms of the third recommendation, that this is broken down further, and it was around ensuring future contracts uh, for the provision of electronic monitoring understand the delivery needs of probation service. This includes having a more rapid notification of license violations, um, improved telephone and email response times. We heard practitioners waiting up to 45 minutes for phone calls to be answered by a real person. Um, improved timeliness of trail monitoring data. Um, in some instances, this was taking up to three days to be returned and we would like to see that, that done in more speedily. And then automatic notification of all curfew violations for people on probation assessed as posing a high risk of serious harm. Thanks, Kevin. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. 
So in terms of Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, HMPPS, there were eight overall recommendations for HMPPS. Um, first and foremost, that was around um, mandating the requirement to make domestic abuse and safeguarding checks before recommending a sentence or release on electronically monitored curfew. And we felt that needed to be addressed at a national policy level. Um, I've combined on this slide, they are separate in the actual report, but um, also along with that mandating the requirement is for um, the, the central teams to support regions in being able to deliver against this, require, this recommendation by engaging at a national level with police and children's social care representatives to, to work out how it can actually be actioned and achieved. Um, I certainly know across a number of our previous inspections, including core and other thematics, um, those domestic abuse and safeguarding checks, um, specifically a core, have been an issue. So we would consider this as well as the next recommendation as requiring immediate attention. The uh, next recommendation relates to HDC address uh, check processes and making an assessment of suitability of the address and making sure that that is explicit. So the current assessment only asks what measures can be put in place to make the address suitable when in some instances the address is not and will not at any point be suitable. Probation practitioners expressed uh, concerns in regards to this with some refusing to actually fill out the paperwork at all or filling it out in such a way they answer the questions they thought they should be asked rather than what's actually on the form and again we feel this requires immediate attention in order to ensure that that robust assessments are being um, submitted to inform decision making. The final recommendation I've listed here relates to broadening the criteria for GPS to all high risk of serious harm cases where it can support the overall risk management plan. Um, an example I've used throughout this inspection has been around the fact that you can use uh, GPS monitoring for a medium risk, um, perhaps um, somebody who misuses drugs and has a number of offences for shoplift, you can, for instance, GPS monitor an exclusion zone for a shopping centre, whereas if I had a high risk sexual offender about to be released from prison, unless he fitted into a very particular cohort, um, I would not have the ability to be able to request that GPS and that, and that just doesn't sit, sit well with the inspectorate. So thanks, Kevin. Can I have the next slide? In total, there are six overall recommendations for the probation service. Um, but whilst this is not on this slide, there's also an additional recommendation here in regard to local regions improving the timeliness of domestic abuse and child safeguarding inquiries with local partners. And that builds on what we're um, recommending um, from a central perspective. Alongside that, we've re We've recommended ensuring that training that promotes the integration of uh, electronic monitoring into overall case management of cases um, and, and evidence that within sentence and risk management plans. Um, in terms of enforcement, we found that a number of cases, as, as I indicated, were not being enforced on a consistent basis um, and therefore there's also a key recommendation around ensuring that cases are enforced as required um, to, do, to address the findings that we've discussed. Uh, so my final slide, can I have the next slide please Kevin? Thank you. New interventions and current pilots. Um, I haven't included in here findings and um, outcomes because um, the, the pilots that we looked at were not specifically in scope for this inspection. In terms of the alcohol abstinence monitoring requirement, um, this came live in, I'm trying to work out my years now, I've had trouble with years just lately. So um, it came out in 2020 in Wales, 2021 nationally in England um, as a potential requirement option for courts. Uh, we did look at 10 cases who were subject to an alcohol abstinence monitoring requirement, but only in Wales. Of those 10 cases, overall, we found there was a lack of identification of how the AMR would enhance protective factors or address related 
um, offending related factors. Although when we inspected cases, we did see improvements in those factors linked to offending, evidenced in nine out of 10 cases, which was really encouraging. There was no evidence, unfortunately, of onward signposting for individuals who continue to use alcohol um, at the point of ending the alcohol activity monitoring requirement. And we found that it was being used to monitor rather than enforce abstinence. This is reflected in the new pilot, actually, for alcohol license, um, license conditions, which has just commenced in Wales. So in terms of the acquisitive crime pathway, uh, this had only just launched at the point the where we went out. Um, so as I say, we don't have any key findings or recommendations around that. One of the innovations for the acquisitive crime pathway is crime mapping. So it will be interesting to see the outcomes um, from that particular pilot. It's now live in 19 police force areas. The other um, pilots that we looked at um, were London pilots dedicated to domestic abuse or knife crime offences. Again, we haven't drawn key findings or recommendations as they weren't in scope for this inspection. However, they will have their own evaluation as part of the pilot process. What we did find in regard to the London pilots was there was dedicated single point of contact for the probation practitioner attached to the pilot, and this seemed to work exceptionally well. Um, as well as um, there was open communication with the central team that those pilots are funded by the uh, Mayor's Office of Policing and Crime, but it was encouraging to see that the learning from it is helping shape future delivery on a national basis. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm now handing over to Tammy to talk around effective practice. Can I just say, um, Shelley, before we get to Tammy, I'm sure people have lots of questions on your presentation. Do start to post them in the chat line if you've got questions and we'll deal with them after our last two speakers. But to, do please start to think about your questions. Thank, thanks, uh, Shelley. Thanks, and uh, yeah, Tammy, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. And great to see so many people here. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to go through uh, contents of our effective practice guide, which we've published alongside the thematic. Before I do, I'd just like to remind people that HMIP's definition of effective practice is, because there's too many E's, E, P, E, M. Um, our definition is where we see our standards delivered well in practice. So the guide starts with an overview of the different types of EM available. So that's GPS, radio frequency and AAMR. And very helpfully, it lists the sentence and requirement types and the different types of technology that can be applied to each each sentence, which for me was really useful. Um, we then reshare the academic insights paper from Professor Huckersby and Dr Holdsworth, which looks at EM and probation practice. Next, we provide a summary of the themes which arose from the penal reform solutions research, which Dr Sarah will go on to explain a bit more about. But if I can just be really cheeky and, and say one of them was um, people on probation said it was really important to think about the purpose so I think it's really helpful when practitioners are, are supervising people that they they talk about EM and what makes it meaningful for that individual and I think that's really nicely summed up by one of the quotes from the people on probation which was um, the tag gave me a second lease of life it was the wake-up call that I needed and a chance to sort out my priorities now for me if I was his probation officer I'd be saying okay so what is this new lease of life? What does it look like for you? What are your priorities? Why is X your number one priority and B your number two priority? Just to reinforce the meaning for that individual. So I look forward to hearing more from you, Sarah, about the other themes. Um, we know it's really important that sentences are managed as a whole. And to do that, it's really important for practitioners to understand electronic monitoring how it works and the whole myriad of ways it can support individuals so reinforcing compliance risk management desistance or ideally all three um, we know probation love a quiz so what we've done is we've embedded a powerpoint in the effective practice guide with um, lots of multiple choice quiz questions to go through the methodology of the thematic inspection and some of the findings. And we're hoping that that will give people the opportunity to deliver this in a team meeting or in peer group learning 
and just talk about the findings and what that means for their practice. So um, to use one of the um, quotes Shelley spoke about earlier, we asked what percentage of practitioners thought EM was helpful in managing risk, and that was 92%. As a follow-on, we asked how many people put that in their risk management plans, and that dropped to 60%. So there's an opportunity for you guys to kind of really sit and explore what that's about, particularly as we know the four pillars approach lends itself really well to including electronic monitoring in the monitoring and control section. Uh, then finally, in that presentation, there's a, a prompt for you just to discuss your own cases, but in the context of what you've learned from, from the quiz. Uh, then next we provide a, a poster that just looks at the, the different benefits of, of EM, both in terms of risk, but also in terms of positive changes. Uh, and we take that opportunity to reshare the recent Hazel Chemshaw Academic Insights Guide, which looks at a blended approach to risk management. Oh, excuse me, get my breath. Uh, the next section, um, when the inspectors were out doing the thematic inspection, I think it talks to what some of Shelley was saying earlier. There is so much guidance out there. And a lot of people said, we'd just really like, like, like a one page guide that just gives some top tips. So as the inspectors were doing the field work, they took note of things which when implemented consistently, and I think that's the key consistently, it led to effective EM delivery didn't quite get it down to one page. Well, technically it's one page, it's just two sides. <laughs> um, and that looks at all the different stages of a person on probation's journey. So just to give you a couple of examples, I won't go through them all because that'll spoil the, the treat of reading it. So pre-sentence, I think you'll guess that we said about the domestic abuse and the safeguarding checks need to be done. Really important um, for the safety of the individual and those resident at the property, if we, especially if we're curfewing people there. Um, Next, at, at uh, prison release, be thinking about when it's most useful to have the EM. Is it when they're in the approved premise? Is it after the approved premise? So some tips there of what, what to think about. At commencement stage, dead simply, just check you've got the contact details for the EM who is supporting the curfew. Um, initial sentence plan, great idea to just include it as an objective, completing the EM. Um, also quite nice for the probation person on probation that, to complete that objective. So it's just it's quite incentivizing for them. Uh, supervision. So if the person's subject to location monitoring, are you routinely asking for the mapping data? And then I think a really important part, are you then discussing that with the person on probation? Where you go in? Why are you there? Those sort of questions. Um, and finally, the review stage. Are you discussing changes, improvements and setbacks with the individual? Only 16% of the cases we looked at were reviewed at the end of the electronic monitor period. And I think that's a really missed opportunity. A really important part of the change process is, is for the practitioners to, to bear witness to the changes, you know, reflect it back and just really help reinforce the individual's progress. So uh, that's available within the guide as a, a downloadable um, pull out, I guess. Uh, we next provide the reader with uh, our standards and expectations in relation to advice to court, advice to the prison and case supervision. And then we highlight those with some case studies taken from the inspection and provide the reader with some reflection questions just to aid people to think about applying it to their own practice. Finally, we conclude with some overall key takeaways and links to further reading on our research page, which if you haven't visited, big plug, you should go and look at it. It's really good. Um, so that's the effective practice guide in a nutshell. And next, I shall be handing over to Dr. Sarah, who will talk about the penal reform solutions contribution to this thematic. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tammy. Um, great to be here, everyone. And um, just to let you know a little bit about us. So Penal Reform Solutions is an organisation that supports personal and organisational growth within criminal justice. Uh, and we had a really fantastic group of lived experience consultants delivering this piece of work, which aimed to capture the voices of people on probation, exploring their experiences um, of being subject to electronic monitoring. So in terms of our sample, we had 42 participants 32 of which identified as male, eight as female and two as other. We had 37 participant, 
adults that were subject to a curfew requirement, seven, um, had, seven of which were home detention curfew from prison. Three participants were subject to the alcohol abstinence monitoring requirement, so the sobriety tag, and two were subject to exclusion zones by, G, um, by GPS. What was interesting around ethnicity, it was a significant amount of our sample were white British, and this was particularly surprising in some of the areas in which um, the inspectorate um, investigated. Um, and so there were some questions there about the disproportionality regarding how many um, white British participants we had or whether it was the case that we weren't able to, I guess, engage those from minority um, background. Our methodology was interviews on the phone and these were semi-structured in nature. So if I could have the next slide and I'll just talk through the kind of key themes. So firstly, communication was a real significant theme that came through throughout the kind of journey of electronic monitoring device. Um, at pre-sentence, people talked about feeling quite daunting and traumatised by the experience and a real lack of knowledge um, in the courts about what electronic monitoring was all about and what were the kind of practical um, practical information about what, what it would entail and what to expect. And this level of uncertainty impacted on people's uh, mental well-being and again links in very much so with our thematic uh, around mental health, we did, which we did earlier last year uh, with, the, um, with the inspectorate. There was also last minute decisions. So in terms of home detention curfews, people, talk, uh, people, on probation, people in prison talked about um, that they had, that was delivered in a very last minute fashion. And so families weren't necessarily ready. They weren't necessarily ready to be released. Uh, and certainly with the uh, sobriety tag, there was very little um, um, knowledge and, uh, and information, uh, particularly in the courts regarding that. And so again, people felt that they were in the dark a little bit. Poor communication also took place with uh, electronic monitoring providers when problems took place. Um, and this led to de delays and confusion over the course of that kind of experience. What was also really interesting in terms of communication uh, and the lack of knowledge around GPS was though was a, a participant that was under IPP, um, had come out of prison after a long period in prison and had very little understanding about the internet around GPS generally. Um, and again, just um, recognising that and recognising that that level to maybe communicate even more so in that case was was recommended. Again, other practical information around if there's an emergency, um, particularly during the pandemic, one, one of our participants was very ill um, and needed to go to hospital and was really in fear, feared that he would be in breach of his electronic monitoring. So it's, he stayed at home in spite of his, him feeling very unwell. So again, clarity around that would, would be greatly beneficial. Shame was our second um, theme, and it it kind of uh, manifested in two two ways, really. Firstly, the um, avoidance of shame of prison. So uh, some of our participants talked about how they kind of avoided prison and how the uh, the shame associated with prison, um, not only for them but for their families, was something that they were they were grateful that they didn't have to go through. And women as well talked a lot about shame specifically uh, in terms of going to work, uh, having to wear trousers in order to cover uh, their tag, not leaving the house because they were embarrassed of the visible display of the tag. Um, so uh, shame was a theme that kind of came through our data and really reiterates some of the research that is, is already out there around the experience of electronic monitoring. We then go into families. Now, this seemed to be a consistent theme throughout our data, um, certainly looking at that protective factor of building, building and nurturing family relationships. And this was particularly valued by those that we interviewed. Uh, again, there were some some limitations. So one particular participant talked about how uh, his electronic monitoring device only worked within the house and that he wasn't able to go into his garden. And so in, in the evenings, not being able to play with his children in the garden was something that he found difficult to manage in terms of being able to kind of take on the responsibility that he wanted to in terms of fatherhood. Um, so family family was certainly something that was important, as was need really, um, in terms of just understanding people's needs, understanding what was meaningful to them. A lot of people talked about how their employment, um, it was quite flexible in terms of their employment. They were able to get changes when they did secure employment. Uh, through the courts and, and with the help of their probation officer, and they greatly valued this, whereas others who didn't have that experience talked about that kind of sense of uh, loss of faith, I guess, in the criminal justice system on broader levels. Employment seemed to be catered for um, a lot of the time. However, other diversity needs, for example, health 
seem to be uh, problematic. So one of our participants talked about having to go through weekly MRI scans due to investigations uh, into her health, and they had to cut off the um, electronic monitoring device each week. And no matter how much she communicated with her, the judge and with her probation officer, uh, she found herself back in court multiple times. Um, and this really deteriorated her mental health um, and caused her a, an awful lot of upset. So understanding people's needs and the impact of that of um, of the electronic monitoring device is certainly something that we we kind of suggested as one of the solutions. Relationships, again, was was really interesting in terms of the importance of relationships, how probation officers went over and above the, re, the to research the device, as one of our participants said. So those probation officers going that extra mile, mile was greatly valued by um, the individuals that we spoke to. And it was also almost a way in which you could build those relationships and in a reciprocate that. So Peter, for example, talked about having an opportunity to be trusted. So by having an electronic monitoring device, he was able to build trust with his probation officer um, so that that relationship could could continue and he could, you know, move move forward as in terms of supporting his assistance. So relationships, again, seem to be really important throughout all of the data and, and influence all of the themes that we kind of um, that we kind of captured. Purpose and meaning, again, was a, was another theme and Again, what was interesting is that when when the electronic monitoring device was deemed as meaningful for the individual that was having it, great things seem to happen. So, for example, if um, people were in prison and wanting to get a home detention curfew, uh, compliance increased, behaviour was better um, because they really wanted to maybe go back to their families or go back into their kind of work environment. So that meaning was really important. What was interesting in terms of the experience of COVID was that ultimately everybody was locked down. So everybody was essentially um, on house arrest in some kind of way. So a number of our participants talked about how it almost became redundant being on an electronic monitoring device during those periods um, because everybody else was in the same boat. And so the meaning of that essentially was, was lost in some ways. And then last but not least, uh, well-being, which links in, I guess, to some of the stuff I talked about in terms of communication and mental health. But well-being was talked about a lot with our participants. Some talked about the electronic monitoring devices being an opportunity to reflect, um, to have a reality check, um, a place where they could, you know, really kind of question their lives and question what was important for them, as, as Tammy eloquently said in terms of one of the quotes that she took from the report. Uh, Alex, again, um, was one of our one of our participants who talked about being in prison seven times over the course of a year and when they coupled electronic monitoring with accommodation um, to address um, his risks associated you know with him being homeless for a lot of his time it really gave him a chance to stop drinking um, and he saw this as a real lifeline so again when those needs were met when it was when meaning was kind of attached then with that well-being and, and that support of rehabilitation kind of took place Conversely, there were other um, issues around well-being. So, for example, the vibration of the sobriety tag every 20 minutes, it making quite a loud noise so um, members of the public could hear it. Um, they, it disturbed them every 20 minutes over the course of the night. Um, and so this vibration led to kind of deprivation of sleep, which kind of exacerbated anxiety for people that, that seem to have this kind of constant edge of who's going to ring me, who's going to be checking on me, am I, am I in the right place? Um, am I missing a call? All of these kind of things seem to lead to this kind of generalised anxiety that they that they had um, for some over the course of their experience of electronic monitoring. So if we can go to my next slide, my last slide, um, we just um, offered a number of solutions, um, you know, to inform and and complement some of the recommendations from the inspectorate. Firstly, to engage and communicate with people on probation, really know the individuals that the, um, that we're working with, understand their lives, understand what me makes um, meaning for them, understand their needs specifically around health and employment and diversity in terms of age and gender and sexuality, et cetera. You know, all of these things are really important. And, and maybe they're almost an opportunity for, for people with lived experience of electronic monitoring, supporting that, you know, supporting that and saying, this is what happened to me. This is what you need to need to, um, you know, learn. These are the top tips to get by. So understanding people, um, designing 
considering the design of the devices in terms of the vibration, in terms of, you know, um, batteries just going dead rather than maybe having some kind of um, traffic light system to ensure that that people know how much how much life is is in, um, in the battery of the devices so that people can plan and people can reduce that level of anxiety when a battery goes flat and they have to wait some time in order to get a replacement. And then finally, um, improve understanding about who's made subject to electronic monitoring. Um, you know, reviewing that, as, as Shelley said earlier, reviewing that regularly with probation, making sure that the issues can be prevented rather than reacting to them before um, the, the impact of someone's well-being and mental health is, is jeopardised. So those kind of small changes, um, basically um, opening up those opportunities to nurture those protective characteristics like employment and family, um, which we know are so significant when it comes to people either coming out of prison or, or being on probation. So if you want to have a look at our report, we also did an easy access podcast just to give you an overview. We sent that to all of our participants to thank them for their engagement. Um, and if you want to get in touch for any reason, then please do um, on the email there. And now I'm going to hand over to Justin, who's going to do a QA. and a Thank you very much, um, Sarah. So as uh, Sarah said, uh, copies of our reports are available both on her well, on her website, but also on ours. If you go to this link, you'll find a copy of our main inspection report. The effective practice guide can also be found on our website, as can um, Sarah's uh, report. There's also a copy of the action plan produced by HMPPS in response to our recommendations, which you can uh, find a link to there. But we've got about 10 minutes for questions. We may be able to run on a bit if people uh, are able to do that. We've got three or four questions already. If you've got others, do please um, put them in the chat line or you can raise your hand on, on Teams. But let's just fire off straight away with the ones that we have already. Charlotte, Charlotte Hales, thanks for your question. Um, she says, within the inspection, were there any observations about the relationship with suppliers in respect of EM uh, delivery? Um, Shelley, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Justin. Um, I think before we went out on inspection, um, there were thoughts around how much, how well the relationship would be working between electronic monitoring providers and probation practitioners. What we found, as I said, encouragingly, probation practitioners were really positive about the impact and, and the use of um, electronic monitoring with their cases, albeit possibly not using it to its best advantage at this point in time, but they were positive about the use of it. In terms of the actual relationship with suppliers, I think it would be fair to say there was frustration on, on both sides. Um, some of that was around communication. So for instance, as I'd said, practitioners were having to wait up to 45 minutes to be able to speak with a real person um, to, to ask for information. When you ask for information, sometimes it takes a significant amount of time to come back. Conversely, um, we spoke with EMS, um, electronic monitoring services who provide um, the equipment, et cetera, um, for electronic monitoring. And there was frustration on their side in terms of for instance, repeated violations on community orders where no action was then taken. Um, and they didn't have that level of communication with probation practitioners to understand why they were repeatedly telling that person that their case was not engaging and why there still wasn't any action. So there was frustration on both parts. However, we also saw some really good evidence of good working relationships, and those tended to be where there were stakeholder managers um, and liaison officers in place from the electronic monitoring services within regions and um, that seemed to improve relationships and that and that two way communication. Great, thanks very much, um, Shelley. Um, another question from Charlotte. What engagement has there been with HMI CFRS given the crossover with policing? both in terms of use of EM and response to breaches and information sharing in respect of safeguarding? Maybe more broadly, you could talk about policing as well, because I know you've been talking to the police colleagues as part of the inspection. Yeah, sure. Is that to me as well, Justin? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. OK, so I haven't actually had any direct uh, engagement with HMIC FRS. Um, it may be that Helen, who's helpfully just put a hand up, uh, may have done. Um, can I just say in terms of the scope for this inspection, we were very specific that we would only be looking at cases who were subject to probation supervision that had an electronically monitored um, uh, 
an electronically monitored element to it. Um, bail cases at the point we went out to scope for this inspection, actual police bail cases were higher in number than probation cases. Um, so we are aware that there is that crossover and like I say for the contracts those are are managed as a as a bigger a bigger piece contract piece um, in terms of the policing liaison we had we spoke with both police crime commissioners and also integrated offender management teams um, as well as heads of public protection and the main discussions there were around those use of the voluntary body tags um, and how useful they were um, in supporting the management of high risk cases. Helen would you like to come in. Thanks Shelley. Just to add Charlotte that the Inspectorate of Policing, we do work very closely with them and um, I've invited the National Police Chiefs Council rep for offender management to join a Chief Inspector Roundtable in the next couple of weeks and for them to help us with those very important recommendations around uh, safeguarding and domestic abuse checks. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Shelley. Um, question from David um, Raffo. I hope I pronounced your surname right there. Um, it was a bit worrying to hear about the lack of signposting following the alcohol abstinence requirements. During the pilot's brief intervention was a key part of the requirement. Not sure why this isn't being promoted. It was found to, as it was found to improve success. Why would you just want to um, monitor? And, and David's included a helpful link to a, a publication about brief intervention. Did Shelley? I know we looked at ten alcohol monitoring requirements in Wales, didn't we? Was there yeah, any yeah. sort of brief interventions being part of that? Um, unfortunately, not, not in the cases that we saw. What I would add to that, though, is what we also probably unexpectedly found um, was that I think three of the cases whereby there'd been an alcohol um, factor in the, in the initial offence, um, those people had gone on to already address alcohol use before being made subject to the alcohol monitoring requirement. So they sailed through in terms of abstinence. What we also found, however, were there were other people who were given um, the requirement who who drank to excess on a fairly regular basis. Indeed, one person was alcohol dependent and it was inappropriately made um, in terms of an order because that shouldn't that should not happen and um, it's unsafe to do so. So in those cases where the people who were made subject to the abstinence requirement um, were were more entrenched drinkers and um, that monitoring actually really supported a reduction in their use. But you're absolutely right, David, that without that that backup and that additional support around brief interventions, um, a lot of that progress will have been Will have been lost at the point where the actual monitoring um, ends. Um, moving forward, there is now a license um, pilot that does include both an option to to request abstinence um, and also one to monitor. And I would imagine, in part, that's because there was some positive progress in those cases where monitoring was actioned rather than uh, breaching for, for lack of abstinence. David, did you want to come back in on that? Was that helpful? Uh, yeah, that was helpful. I was I was actually involved in the implementation group on the uh, on, on the first pilot in, in London. And I say brief intervention was just so helpful. Yeah. And uh, that seems to be borne out by what Shelley's saying, the, the experience. Uh, so, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be disappointed if it wasn't sort of promoted. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say a full alcohol program, but that brief intervention was very, very uh, effective. So, and, thank you. and most definitely, David, we what we looked at was kind of exit strategies for people. So having successfully completed that period um, on the alcohol abstinence monitoring requirement for those people who were still at a stage where alcohol was a feature of their lifestyle, what onward um, signposting happened um, uh, and unfortunately um, that wasn't evidenced. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what I've, it's not just getting someone through the order. It's about what happens afterwards, isn't it? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and certainly a brief intervention with something that, you know, helps people to be signposted to things so that they can they can carry on with the with the, the good work and build on on their success. Thanks, Thanks David. We're, we're nearly out of time, but there's a couple more questions I'd like to try and get through. If people can stay on for um, 
a bit. Question from Steve. Steve, I, I think, it, is it bag or baggy? Um, there seems to be considerable social value, for example, in terms of educational well-being elements to electronic monitoring. To what extent do the inspectorate feel this should be considered in any future EM-related procurement um, evaluation? I don't know, Shelley, do you want to have a bash at that? Do, does the business case for electronic monitoring take account of these sort of positive social and economic impacts, or is it purely about cost savings? I do think we have the person responsible for uh, procurement on the line, but I'm oh, not sure it'd be okay. fair to drop him straight into it at this point in time. So what I would say um, from from the inspector perspective, as I see it, is um, Steve, you're absolutely right around that considerable social value. Most definitely electronic monitoring gives a period of stability. That's what we found um, for individuals. What we unfortunately found was that this was then not being enhanced to, to the best advantage. So I think it would be quite difficult from a contract package type um, perspective to include that in any type of procurement evaluation. I might be wrong. Um, but what I would say is that I think probation possibly need to be clearer in terms of what outcomes they would like to see achieved during that period of electronic monitoring um, and help support um, help support delivering those during the period of electronic monitoring. So I think it really sits with probation delivery rather than electronic monitoring procurement. That would be that would be my thoughts. Thanks, Shelley. Um, final question from Neil, Neil C. Interesting to see such limited coverage of GPS cases in the PRS work. Did you identify factors which inhibited use of this new tool? Should some curfew subjects have been better put on um, GPS. I don't know, Sarah, can you remember if we talked to many who'd uh, had GPS monitoring? Sarah's maybe struggling a little oh, no. bit with microphone. Would you like me to start to answer on your Oh, no, it's off. It's oh, no, it's there. Sorry, it just I, it lost it for me. I lost my button. Um, so in terms of we had a really small amount. We only had, um, I think it was... Uh, yeah, it was only two. So um, we really struggled in terms of just generally getting a sample. So to get 42, we were quite pleased with. But yeah, it was interesting to see that the majority of the people that we did speak to, um, you know, were on those copies, but not through GPS. So, um, but we we didn't find any particular reasons why there was, uh, you know, those what factors inhibited that use. I guess um, I don't know if Shelley's got any other. Yeah, Shelley, I think we we I think you did find some, quite a few reasons why perhaps it wasn't being as used as it, much as it could be. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, if you've got court officers writing reports in court who don't know that it's an option um, on a community order, it's most certainly the sentences that we spoke to held real high value in the reports that and the recommendations they received in court from probation. So there were lots of courts not making these orders on the basis that they were not being suggested by probation. Um, also, another factor that inhibited the use of GPS is around the tight um, criteria of what license cases it could be used for. And also um, that lack of training and lack of understanding about how it could enhance um, enhance the sentence. So I think the second part of the question there, Neil, was around should some curfew subjects be in better placed on GPS and most definitely. So we saw, for instance, cases in court that would have um, a, a curfew, but they would also have an exclusion zone. The curfew would be electronic monitored, the exclusion zone wouldn't be. Um, and actually in court, you have the option to do that. So yeah, it could have been better used. What I'd also say, and for those practitioners on the line, um, HDC, regardless of sentence type, um, HDC can be monitored by GPS. So if you have somebody coming out who has an exclusion zone, for instance, or you are concerned about lifestyle activity, etc., on release, if it's, necess if it's necessary and proportionate to do so, you can actually request GPS for that four month of HDC monitoring um, with a trail monitoring requirement attached to it. Um, it's there to be used and there's some really good ways it could be used. Um, but right now, I think the lack of understanding is probably the biggest inhibitor alongside the strict, the strict criteria around high risk cases.
Thanks, Charlie. I think the other, the other factor you highlight is the lack of a sort of self-access portal for probation practitioners to get direct access to location monitoring data. Yeah. They have to put in a request for a map. It can take, like you were saying, up to three days to come back again. So yeah, absolutely. I think if there's some sort of desktop access to that data, that, that might really bring home to them the value of, of that tool in the future. That's a really valuable point, Justin, and apologies, because um, I think possibly Charlotte's question that in terms of that relationship as well, access to such a, um, a portal would help improve um, both how yeah, electronic monitoring is delivered and how it's used. Um, so most definitely the use of a portal, I think it was something like 98 percent, and that's off the top of my head, of practitioners thought it would be helpful to be able to access directly information about their cases and that seems to make perfect sense to me. Thanks, Shelley. I think we're going to have to wrap it up now. We're out of time, but thank you ever so much to everyone who's dialed in today. I hope you found today useful. Do have a look at the full reports and the effective practice guides on our website. Can I say a big thank you to our presenters, to Shelley and to Tammy uh, and to Sarah for, for all of your input today, and a big thank you to Kevin as well. Uh, and, and Lynn, who have both helped with organising the event today around the logistics and uh, taking bookings. Um, do look out for future events. We do one of these for all of our thematic inspection reports, so there will be plenty more to follow uh, this year. Do give us some feedback as well. We'll be sending out a survey to all of you, and we really welcome uh, any any comments you've had about uh, about today. But uh, in the meantime, thank you all again. Thanks for joining, Thanks, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.